recorder is started already. So at this point of this class, I think it is going to be helpful to tr be able to track the execution of programs because I think that trace would really actually help you understand, you know, how call and return works. Um, there are a few ways to do it. Um, from your perspective, you know, the ones that are still visible, uh, I just revised, you know, this particular document so it has the latest and greatest uh, information. So I'm going to show you guys how to set it up first, okay? You know, for those of you who are using Windows, um, the instruction is a little bit different compared to when you use a Mac. And surprisingly, if you use a Mac, it's actually easier than, you know, if you use Windows. So, um, so this is what I'm going to do. Um, I also sent you know, in the announcement two things that might be of interest to some people. So if you go to the announcement, uh, one of my previous students from CISP 310, a top-notch student of mine, um, is now tutoring at the LRC, the Learning Resources Center. So the schedule is already in that message. If you want to get some additional tutoring or help, you know, that is a resource. Um, the other one is you know, chat GPT explaining how to understand your know, concept at the deeper level, which is actually what is needed in this class. So if you um, want to learn more tricks and get you know, more tips and you know, know how to you know, kind of get more tools to help you gain a deeper understanding of topics, you know, this particular, I mean, there's a link to the chat GPT conversation. So don't scroll through the whole thing you know, to the very end, okay? Because it was a conversation. So you might want to just kind of read through the whole thing because you know, it actually mentioned about note-taking techniques, you know, different styles of note-taking and so on. So I think it might be helpful to some people. Um, I'm not sure, okay? You know, so, so there is that. All right, so back to um, how to set up your PC. So let me just kind of give you guys a demonstration first because I think this is going to be important you know, for this class. So to do that, I am going to vdi.loadsreels.edu. You guys can do the same thing too, but I don't see any reason why you want to run a virtual machine if you already have a desktop computer in front of you. <clears throat> if you have a thumb drive with you today, that can be very helpful because you can actually set this up on a thumb drive. If you do not, it is not the end of the world either because you can just you know, kind of not use a thumb drive today and then repeat the process when you do have access to a thumb drive. So um, this part is not important to you because you know, I'm just going into a virtual machine that runs Windows. So I'm just signing into Windows you know, as usual. Um, please quit. I don't want to use multiple monitor. So it's just going to use a single monitor. So once again, if you're using a PC, you can actually put this tool on a thumb drive. It will take up about, about 1.5 gigabytes of space, so it's a little bit you know, bulky. But compared to a lot of things these days, you know, 1.5 you know, gigabytes is not that much. Okay. All right, so this is Windows starting up. And I'm looking at my recorder just to make sure that it is also recording the, the entire screen. It is, okay, excellent. So the first thing we need to do, uh, it's probably better if you just kind of look at you know, what I do here and you know, perhaps you'll just jot down notes you know, occasionally. So you need to sign in to your Google Drive first and I would choose the one you know, from school because you need to get to a particular file because you need to download that file first. So we are going to, um, because I signed in a little bit earlier, looks like it is giving me the same uh, virtual machine as last time, which is kind of cool. So now I go to drive.google.com. So I, I just signed into my, you know, as myself. Okay, never mind. It did not sign into that. I have to sign in again. Mm -hmm. If you use a Mac, you know, the tool is available to you as well, and it is considerably easier to set up on a Mac. Okay. All right. Just repeat the whole process again. Okay. 
and of course it has to ask me for dual authentication. There you go. All right. Yes, it is me. There we go. Okay. So I am going to my shared drive, okay, which you already have access to. So the, you know this part here, you you don't see as much stuff, you know, but you know we're just going to the shared drive of. Um, nope, not that. I need to go to the class first. So C I S P three ten, and then under here I go to my shared drive. So once I'm here, this is the same drive that you can access from the course information from Canvas. Okay, so this is you know exactly where you have been getting all the other stuff. So you go to processor again. If you're using Windows, then you need to download a file called Sig Reaper Spider. So this is the file that you need to download. It's a it's a pretty good size file. Okay, so you just click download, and it's going to complain that it's too big to be scanned for viruses and whatnot. <clears throat> it's okay. Just go ahead and download it. It's going to take. In the virtual machine, it is really fast because the virtual machine lives within the same infrastructure as. Um, the actual you know, Google Drive and it has a very good connectivity. But when you're doing this at home, it might take a while, okay? Because you know, what you're downloading is about 400 megabytes. So once everything is downloaded, um, the next thing I'm going to do here is to go here and I want to open up uh, in the folder. So I'm opening in the folder so this way, you know, I can right click on it so that I can use 7-zip to uh, decompress it. If you do not have 7-Zip already installed on your computer, it's okay, it's not a problem. All you need to do is to look up your 7-Zip you know, with, uh, with, with a hyphen, go to the download page, and then choose you know, the operating system that you have. You know, most people just choose the first you know, choice here because you know, by this time, you know, very few people be, would be running a 32-bit operating system. So you just you know, pick the first one, get your know, 7-zip installed, take all the defaults, you, know, you don't have to change anything. If you're doing it on lab computers here, 7-zip is already set up, okay? So you don't have to set up a single thing if you're doing it in the lab. All right, so having said that, I am going to go back here. So right click, and then you just go to 7-zip, and then you can extract the files. Now, when you extract the files, you know, um, as an example, I just extract it here or extract it to Sig River Spider, but it's up to you to decide where you want to extract it to. If you have a thumb drive, you can go to Extract Files, and then it will ask you where do you want to extract it to. So you can basically choose your thumb drive from here, and then you can, it will work from a thumb drive, okay? This is a pretty versatile tool, so this way you don't have to repeat this process every single time in the lab. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm just going to extract it to the same folder, which is my downloads folder. So I just go like here. It will take a while, okay, especially on the thumb drive. This can take potentially like 40 minutes on a thumb drive, okay? So even if you had a thumb drive today, you may not be able to finish it today, you know, unless you start now. Um, the reason why it would take so long is because, you know, there are a bazillion small files, okay? If it is one gigantic file, it's not going to take that long, but because it has a bazillion of you know, little files, then that's why it is taking a pretty significant amount of time to decompress the files. But you only have to do it once, okay? If you put it onto your thumb drive, you only have to do this step once, okay? <clears throat> so as it is doing this, I can explain what the tool does, okay? So the tool allows you to kind of short circuit a whole sequence of steps in order to track the execution of program. Can you do it without this tool? Yes, as I have been doing it for many years. And then one year, I decided, okay, this is too much of a hassle. I'm gonna write some script so that I can automate the entire process, okay? So if you don't wanna use this tool, you can still do it. It's just eh, a little bit more painful that way. And I'll show you guys how to do it too. Um, as you can see, it is still decompressing, <clears throat> which is okay. 
So what I can also do is to show you, you know, what, what do you gain, you know, by using this tool. So what you gain by using this tool is, you know, you don't have to use this tab anymore to upload your source code. So your source code will get longer and it, it will become kind of more of a hassle to have to do this you know, every so often. But it will also give you the analysis tab. And right now the analysis tab is getting updated. Okay, so we'll just kind of force it to update. There we go. So the analysis tab is actually a full trace of the execution of the program. Column A is telling you where the PC is. In other words, it is telling you what is the address of the instruction that just executes. Okay, so when you look at this, so it, I'll point out here, line two, okay, row two tells me that I just executed the, the no instruction. Row three is telling me that at location one, I just executed an LDI instruction. Well, what does the LDI instruction do in this case? It will load a constant of five into register A. So column D reflects changes to register. Okay, so whenever a register is changed, column D is the one that will tell you, that will tell you which register got changed and how, what is the new value in that register. Okay, so I have AND AA, okay, the mysterious AND AA instruction. What does it do? Well, it doesn't really change the value of register A because you know, it is still having a value of five. However, it does affect flat. So in this case, it shows us that the C, D, S, O, and L, they are all zero. Does that make sense? Because register A is a non-zero, okay? So that's why you know it is. Um, it has all five flags you know, being zeros in this case. And then the JCI instruction is what line four is or row four is. So row four has from JCI to L2, but since the Z flag is a zero, we are not going to label L2. We are just going to the next line in this entire program. And that's what the you know, row eight is reflecting. And by the way, column F is the line number, and then column G is the actual line of that line number. Mm -hmm. So this way you don't have to go back and forth between your source code and you know, the trace here. It actually shows you what is the line number and what is the code on that line that just executed. Okay, so in this case, it's a decrement A, and decrement A, you expect your register A to decrement from five to four, and that's exactly what it did. Is that okay? Does everybody kind of get a sense of you know, what the analysis tab is about? This is pretty much the only tool you have to debug your program, but it can also be used to understand you know, the concepts that we are going to talk about in this class. Um, in this particular program, I don't think we change a lot of RAM locations, so, it's, so nothing is happening to column C. If I do change any RAM location, column C, C will indicate which location of RAM is changed to what value. So that is also going to be helpful because you know, in today's class, we'll talk about push and pop in assembly language, okay? So that is, so this is a tool, okay? I think it's going to be a very useful tool to help you kind of visualize what happens when we call a function and what happens when we return from a function. All right, so let me see how the um, how the baking is going. Okay, the baking is all done. This is kind of like an infomercial. As I demonstrate, you know, the, the kitchen tool, you know, something else is going on in the background, so now it is all baked, okay? So let's check out what is in the oven. So inside the oven, we have, you know, thick wind or thick river spider, and then within that, there's a thick wind subfolder. So within here, we have executables, okay? They're not exactly executables, these are batch files. So this is the only one that you need to use, okay? So you just need to use this one, double click it. And you know, the first time you run it, it's gonna take a little bit of time, also depending on you know, your uh, computer. You know, some computers can be slightly faster and other ones can be a little slower. But once you get it going, you know, it is not slow. Okay, especially on a thumb drive, you know, getting it to run the first time can be time consuming because a lot of thumb drive you know, are not really quite as fast as they advertise them to be. Okay, so it's going to take a little bit of time, you know, it's going to say loading this, loading that, which is all 
fine. Let it finish, and then you'll see a prompt. The prompt is funny looking. You know, it is bright green. You know, on a bar, and then, and then you type underneath it. You'll see. There you go. So this is the prompt. Okay, you are quote unquote good. Okay, you know, as far as scheduling is concerned, you're the administrator. Relax. Okay, it cannot actually make changes to the rest of, of your system. So after you get to here, you go to Reaper Spider, which is a subfolder. Press the Enter key, and now you're inside the subfolder. It still recognizes Windows command in addition to Linux command. So if you want to look at the content of a folder, you can use ls, which is the abbreviation of list. Okay, so it shows you a bunch of files here. But if you remember the Windows command to look at the folders, which is dir, that works as well. Okay, so you can choose to use you know, all the Windows CLI commands, command line interface commands, or you can use the Linux command. Is that okay so far? All right. So there's one thing you need to do, okay, you know, to get it to work. Uh, well, I'll say two things. So th there's a, I created a new uh, assembler, you know, for students. So this is your know, assembler student, and you want to make a copy of that. Okay, so go to the folder where the files are located, and go to this your know, assembler student, and make a copy of that. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So I go here, and then I go to file, and then make a copy. And I'll say you know, for tech. Okay, there you go. And I can create it in the same folder because you know, I own the folder. You cannot create it in the same folder because you don't own that folder. So when you are doing this, make sure you change the folder to some place on your own Google Drive. So I'll just make a copy. All right. So I have shortened the number of steps you know, to use this. The only thing you do need to do is to go to extensions, and then you go to um, app script. You don't have to do any change in the app script part here, but what you do need to do is to go to deploy, click on deploy, click on new deployment, and then make sure it is a web app. You can describe it any way you want, okay? You know, nobody's gonna see it. So we'll say text local copy of the PPP assembler. There we go. Do not change these, okay? You need the web app to execute as you. And then you also want to make sure that everybody has access to it. So do not change these. So the me is going to change, obviously, okay? This me is me. And then you know, when you do this, you know, the me is going to be you. So keep all that and then click deploy. So once you click deploy, it will give you a URL, okay? So that URL is important. You can get back to the URL later on, okay? But I would just, okay, ask you for authorized access, blah, 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 which account, and it will confirm that, you know, we are okay with you know, this script, you know, uh, see, edit, create, and delete your Google Sheets, your know, uh, spreadsheets, uh, blah, 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 you know, just click allow. Okay. All right, so this is the important part. This deployment ID is not important, okay? You can ignore that. But this web app URL, that is important, okay? So click on copy, and then you want to switch back to your, um, oh, okay, I'm running this in a virtual machine. So this, this is the part that is important. Run a cat and then the, the greater than symbol to web app dot url okay it's just a regular text file so what this is doing is it will basically copy whatever i type on the keyboard to this file okay this is the, the one thing that you have to do because otherwise the entire class will be sharing the same assembler you guys would be clobbering each other's code and that would not be fun okay so this is how you can make your assembler yours okay so press the enter key and then control V because I already made the copy. So I just need a control V to paste the actual URL of the script, press the enter key, and then control D to end the paste. Now, if you want to do this with notepad, that works too. So you can say notepad web app dot URL, and then you can also just you know, paste into uh, notepad if that is what, how you want to do it. 
So there are many ways to do the same thing. Just choose uh, whichever way you think is kind of the handiest way for you to do it. Now everything is set up. So now that everything is set up, there's already, there's a sample program here called test, oops, test.pppasm. It's written here you know, just so that you know, I can test the code to make sure that it works. So you can alter this program if you want to, but you can also keep it the same you know, as it is right now. It's up to you, okay? But all I'm doing is to test to make sure it works. So you have to say dot slash submit dot sh, you know, this invokes the script that is doing all the actual work, and then you give it the name of the PPP ASM file. Now the extension of PPP ASM does not need to be PPP ASM, okay? If you just want to save your file in Windows as .txt, that works fine, okay? It is not a problem. The extension is insignificant when it comes to these tools. So press the enter key. If everything works, then it will automatically submit the file to the spreadsheet. It will assemble it, download the CSV file back, run it inside Logistream on the command line, and then you'll capture the trace data and then upload the tra trace data back into the spreadsheet so that you know, now we have the actual code um, or the, uh, the running of the code in the analysis tab, which is just like last time because it's exactly the same code. Is that okay so far? Okay, so this whole thing is being recorded, okay? So don't worry if you think, okay, I might have missed a few steps, you know, because I'm trying to jot it down because, you know, the whole thing is now recorded. It is also written in the, um, in one of the documents, you know, that's linked from Cam from Canvas. Okay. All right. So let me just kind of refresh this, you know, just to make sure everything looks good. Sometimes it takes a refresh. You cannot see this one unless you have a photographic memory and can type as, you know, in human speed and you just, you know, type my original URL into your screen. So there's no way, I think there's no way you guys can be looking at this one because this is my private account. Is that okay? So the objective is to make sure that you guys can all have your local copy like this. Now you can also do the same thing, you know, with the one that you already have, okay? Because I know most of you already have your own assembler. You just have to kind of, okay, I take it back. Just start with this one <laughs> because there are a few configurations that makes it not work. All right, so having said this, let me go back to all the topics and kind of give you a pointer of you know where we are now okay so this particular module okay you know it is already actually loaded but this will tell you you know the short way and the long way of doing what i just did the longer way is actually significantly longer so i can demonstrate the the, the actual long way to do this so if you have done this if you have been doing this in the lab or you know, if you're done with this in the lab and you go like, well, but I want to kind of copy the entire thing into uh, onto a thumb drive. It's easy. So Control D, you know, on in this window was we basically exit. Control D is known as end of file in Linux. Okay. So when you type end of file or Control D in the command line interface, you're telling the command line interface that I'm ready to go. Okay. I believe typing exit would do the same thing. Okay. But Control D is easier. Okay, so once you have this working, okay, and you go like, okay, I'm doing this in the lab and I'm, I got this whole thing working, you can copy and paste this entire folder onto a thumb drive, if that is what you want to do. Just keep in mind, that will take a long time, okay? You know, it can take like 40, 50 minutes, depending on what kind of a thumb drive you have. Are we good so far? Do we have any questions about the process? We good? Okay, excellent. So I just tested this this morning. So I know for sure this script does work, okay? Because sometimes, you know, it, I have to make it uh, to work with Mac OS, Linux, and also Windows. And the three operating systems, you know, differ by just a little bit of, of how they handle end of line. And some of the text processing tools also behave differently. So I have to debug you know, that portion quite a bit. And I don't have a Mac to debug it. So if you're using a Mac, you can also use the Mac version of this tool, which is only 20 megabytes to download. It is significantly shorter compared to this one. 
Alrighty. Um, right. So the instructions here. So the instruction you know, gives you um, the long way, which means you, know, you absolute, absolutely do not want to you know, download any tools. Uh, this is not intended to be a table. I need to fix that. The shorter way is what I just illustrated, especially the Windows part. So um, you know, this document gives you basically all the information that you need in order to make this to make use this to make use of this tool. All right. With all that said, we are now going back to the discussion of calling and returning, which is what what we talked about last Thursday. So I believe that is returning, calling and returning from subroutines. You know, that's the module that we were at you know, last Thursday. We basically talked about the C code, okay, of how to push and how to pop a value. But I also, you know, finished a program. So I did ex some extensions on the notes here. So if you go all the way down to the end of the C code, I actually uh, provided a link to a slightly more complicated but easier to visualize um, C program. Okay, so I'm just going to go there to illustrate what this is all about. So if you go there, it will bring you to um, online GDB directly. And this program you know, does run like you know, right off the bat. So you just click run, and it gives you a trace of what happens to the stack. Um, it gives you a slightly better representation of what the stack looks like, because it will actually tell you what the stack has in terms of the content, and which part is the top of the stack. Okay, so this will give you an idea of, oh, if I push, push, and push, you know, those are the items on the stack, and in what order are they arranged, okay? And the ordering of, you know, how things are arranged also is consistent with the typical way that I display memory content, which means, you know, the 0 C3, which is actually 23, is at a higher location than the 0 4 1, which is, quote, unquote, the top of the stack, but it, it's actually at the lowest location. Okay, so if you want to change this code and you go like, okay, what if I pop, 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 and then push, 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 and so on and so forth, just change this code, you know, insert and delete, you know, as you want to, to basically have your own sequences of your pushing and popping so that you can visualize, you know, what the stack should look like in a sequence as you push and pop the content. Are we doing okay so far? So this tool is available to you, okay? You don't have to use it. I'm not going to ask any questions about you know, this particular tool. It is just here to help you, know, um, you to visualize your stack-related operations. Is that okay so far? Cool. All right. Excellent. <clears throat> but for those of you who are curious, it's like, okay, you know, this is a regular C program, okay? So for those of you who are curious, and you know, want to find out you know, what is a double pointer and so on and so forth, you're more than welcome to read the program and try to figure out you know, how it works. I did not leave behind any comments because you know, that was not the intention of this program. All right, so now we get back to the module because now we need to really talk about you know, calling and returning, okay? In other words, in assembly language, how do we call and return you know, from a subroutine. Okay, so we'll go ahead and try a you know, simple program, and I am going to use my own you know, Ripper Spider um, kind of natively instead of using the Windows one. Mm, I can use the Windows one too, why not? So we'll go ahead and use this one. <laughs> so just go into this folder, go into this folder, and then click your SigWin portable and just wait a little bit until it gives you the command line interface. See, the second time is a whole lot faster because you know, the files are already cached in the operating system, so it doesn't have to go to the disk to actually grab the files you know, anymore. So remember, once you get here, you have to CD or change directory to Ripper Spider. And then once you're here, you can use Notepad to write your code, you can use Vim to write your code, it, it's your choice, okay? If you have Notepad++ installed in the system, that will work as well, okay? So I'm just gonna use Notepad, you know, because most people are just familiar with Notepad, so that's one, what I'm gonna use. I'll call this program called return.ttpasm, and once again, the extension is not important. So I'm gonna create this, 
And every program that you want to use with a spider force, it has to start with a no op instruction. Okay, so you have to make sure that every program starts with a no op. Okay, that's unfortunately that's just uh, how things are. And we want to you know pretend that we have a main. Okay, so I'm going to jmp i to main over here. Main is my quote unquote main function, and it is you know when main is done, we just have a halt. And then we have your know, function f. Okay. So when we write a function in assembly language, this is all it is, okay? All you need is a label to mark the beginning of the function, okay? Because you know, all I need is the, a label for the entry point so that I can do a JMPI from the rest of the program to the entry point of the function. So this is equivalent of defining your F open and close parent with a void, okay? And, okay, so we'll, I'll just kind of comment here and say, I need to write some code to do the return, okay? Return go, code goes here. So we are going to take a look at things from the perspective of main. So we know that, so don't copy this code, okay? Because I'm gonna insert a lot of things in between. So we know that you know, this is going to basically be the last thing that we do when we call function f, because we need continuation. We need to continue execution at the label f. Is that okay? So JMPI F is gonna do the trick. So this is the easy part, okay? This is the last thing to do when calling F, okay? So the problem is, um, how does F return back to main? So the concept behind this whole thing, you know, why we need to talk about the stack first, is in order to get it to work, we have to basically, we have to push the return address first, okay? So now the return address is on the stack. And then when we are in F here, now we have to say pop the return address, which was pushed by the caller. And then we have to continue execution at the return address, okay? So I'm only using comment here to indicate what needs to be done, okay? But we don't have the actual assembly code to do it just yet. Is that okay? So does everybody understand, you know, just looking at the comment and go like, okay, so I can see how the stack can be useful in this case. Because the stack is a universal resource, both to the caller and the function being called. They can both see the stack. So that means, you know, if I push something from the caller, the callee or the function being called can access the stack and go like, oh, I can I can check out what you just you know, saved on the stack. So the stack is the main communication medium between the caller and the callee. Right now, we're only concerned about calling and returning, but later on, when we talk about parameters, local variables, and so on and so forth, the stack is still useful for those purposes. Those purposes. Okay, so the first thing now is to go like, uh, where's the return address? Well, when we are done, the return address is going to be here. So this is going to be return address from the first call to F, okay? Talk about self-documenting self name, okay? Is that okay? Does everybody understand why this label is marking the return address? Because when the function is done, I don't want it to go back to here. I need it to continue to with whatever is right after the JMPIF instruction. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So this is how I mark the return address. So now what is left is I need to push the return address. You go like, hmm, but Tech, you haven't really talked about how to push the return address of anything for that matter using assembly code. Well, you're correct, I do not. I have not done that yet. So what we do is we look at the C code and then we try to translate the C code into assembly code. So what do we do when we are pushing the return address or we, when we push something in C code? Okay, so can someone quote the C code, the two statements in C that we need to execute in order to quote unquote push something on it? Okay, I hope this does not look you know, strange to you because we have to decrement the stack pointer first, okay? You can do pre or post decrement. It really does not matter in this case 
because nobody is using the actual value of the expression of this entire thing. Okay, so because nobody is using this particular value, whether you perform a pre-increment or post-decrement, post-decrement or pre-decrement, it really makes no difference. Okay. After that, what did we do? This is a push. So we store something at the stack pointer and the value that we want to store, I'm just using X as a placeholder of what value I want to store at the location that the stack point is pointing to. So these two lines of code was what we talked about last Thursday. Is that okay? So if this is reminding you, oh yeah, this looks familiar, good, okay? If you are one of those people who go like, yeah, I actually remember what those lines are, but I don't want to raise my hand so that the entire class has their attention on me, even better, okay? On the other hand, for people who are looking at this line, these two lines of code and go, never seen it before, then we got some studying to do, okay? Because I do want to point out these indicator of, you know, you might need to spend more time to review the material because that is actually important, okay? All right, so now the question is, um, I have not seen SP as a register anywhere within the processor. That is entirely correct because this particular processor has what we call general purpose registers. There are no special purpose registers like the x86, the Intel architecture. What does that mean? Well, it means for the four, regis the four registers that we do have, registers A, B, C, and D, they are all equal. Okay, whatever instruction you want to use, it will work on any one of these four instructions, uh, four registers. Okay, so that's why they're called general purpose registers. As opposed to special purpose registers, the x86 is a special purpose register architecture, which means certain instructions will implicitly use a particular register, but not the other registers that are also available. Okay. So in this case, I go like, hmm, okay, so TAC is just randomly choosing one of the four and say, okay, you are the stack pointer from here on, okay? So that turns out to be register D. So in TTP ASM, okay, I have to kind of use boldface here. The convention is to use register D as the stack pointer, okay? In other words, the architecture itself does not have anything indicating that, oh, register D is our stack point. Nope, this is just a convention that we will agree to use register D as the stack point. Is that okay? All right, so it's just a convention, but it has to be a consistent convention, okay? So once we have chosen register D as our stack point, every program that we are writing from here on will use register D as a stack point which also means the register D is no longer available for any other purpose. Its only role is to serve as the stack one. Okay. So given that is the case, so that means SP minus minus really boils down to, oh, let's subtract one from register D. Do we have an instruction that can do this? Okay, so which instruction, which single instruction can do this? Decrement, okay, very good. So decrement D will do, get this job done. All right, the next one is a little trickier because what we want to do is to store to whatever registry D is pointing to and we want to store the value of the label which is return address from first call to F, okay? But that's not gonna work. It is not going to work because if you look up the opto table, it is expecting a register at the second, what we call operand, okay? It's expecting a register to the right-hand side of the column. This is a label, okay? A label will go anywhere where the I is expected, okay, the immediate value is ex expected, but if we are, if we're expecting a register and there's no way we can actually get it to work. So now it's like, <clears throat> okay. So that means you know, I have to put it into a register first. So LDI, pick one of the other three registers, A, B, or C, okay? It doesn't matter which one you choose. We'll pick register A, okay? Now you give it the label. There we go. And now instead of using the label here, I just have to use label A, I mean, register A. Is that okay? All right, 
So this is going to accomplish this, okay? You know, so now, by the time we are done with here, we would have pushed the return address on the stack. Is that okay? We also have to initialize the stack pointer, which is kind of trivial because you know, the stack pointer needs to be initialized. So LDID, and we want it to be initialized to one byte past the end of the entire memory space, which is 255 plus one, which is 256, which is also known as zero because we only have eight bit registers. So with an eight bit register, you cannot really store the value of 256 because 256 is two to the power of eight. The best you can do is two to the power of eight minus one. Okay, so that's why zero is also AKA, also known as 256, 512, and so on, because all the math are congruent modulo 256. It just goes in a circle. Okay. All right, so now we have this code already done, and the best part about using um, the tool, okay, River Spider, is you can actually work, your, work on your program gradually, okay? You don't have to finish the whole thing. So what I'm gonna do here is to say, okay, we'll just put a halt here so that you know, the program stops here, okay? I know the program is not done, but I want to know the effect of all the instructions that I have up to this point. Is that okay? All right. So that's what I would do. Um, I can exit the editor, make sure we save the file first, and then we just you know, do a slash dot, a dot slash, uh, submit.sh, and then the name of the file, which is call return.pttasm. That's the enter key. If it does have any assembly error, it will report it. It will tell you that there are some problems with the assembling your process. So if it tells you everything is good, it means it's actually good. All right, so wait until this whole thing is done, okay? So once it confirms the trace data uploaded, you know, check the analysis sheet, that's when we go to the analysis sheet and check it out. Okay, so this is the analysis sheet right now. So we can see the entire program executing here, but we also see the side effects of the instruction. The first one is no op, okay, obviously no op doesn't do a single thing. The second one is LDI with zero. So even though the register is, was initialized with a value of zero, it also emphasized that, yeah, this is an LDI zero instruction, Register D is getting a, a value of zero. Okay, so that's kind of handy. And then we do an unconditional branch to main because I want to preserve the ordering of how the functions are defined. So JMPI to main, and this is location, this is the location right after the main label with decrement D. So the stack pointer changes from zero zero to FF, okay, which is to be expected. So now we are ready to store the value of the return address from first call to F, which is this label here. That label turns out to have a value of zero C. It is put into register A, and then in return, we push that in onto the stack. Now, this part is important because this belongs to column C, which is RAM write, which is telling me that the content, the value of zero C is now stored at the location of FF. I am borrowing the syntax from C++. Are we, are we okay with that notation? Because the left-hand side is what is being changed. The right-hand side is the value that we use to change the left-hand side. Is that okay? All right. And that gets us to the halt instruction. So you go like, are we really sure that 0c is really the place that we need to go back to after the function is done? You can go to the assemble tab and double check for yourself. So basically what we can now do is to go to the label that we defined, which is uh, this particular label here, and look at the location. It really is at location 0c. Is that okay? So let me just kind of pause here and go back to the, um, analysis tab and see if there are any questions about what this program has done so far. This is not the finished program, okay? All we have managed to do up to this point is to push the return address from the caller's perspective so that when we get to the callee, okay, the function to be called, which is F, 
the return address is now sitting on the stack. Is that okay? I'll give you guys a little bit more time to, yep. That is the whole screen tab. Because I wanted to put a whole screen tab so that I can know like, okay, did I set up the stack correctly by the time it gets there? So that's the idea that you stop and have a first of all construction and not a whole construction later. All right. So this particular display is useful because it actually shows you the line number too. It shows you the line number in column F it shows you the actual code in column G, okay? Because without this, you know, you can, you kind of have to go back and forth, which is really cumbersome. With this, yeah, you can kind of see how the program executes and what are the effects of executing each particular instruction. Now, the rest of the columns are not used, okay? So that means if you want to, you can actually add your own comments or whatnot, you know, with the rest of the set. Or you can make a copy of this, okay? You, all you have to do is to just go to file, download this particular sheet as a you know, CSV or TSV, it doesn't matter. Once you download it, it's just a table more than, you know, it, it, ha it has no particular meaning. But at that point, you have a snapshot, then you can use Excel to document things all you want. Okay, so this gives you, you know, the basic run of, a co of the code so that you can later on, if you choose to, you'll know, document the whole thing. It's like, oh, this is how we push something, this is how we pop something. All right, so with this all done, we are now switching back to the editor because now we want to go like, okay, let's try to finish more of this program. So I'm going back and use Notepad here. So in Notepad, I go to you know, F here and go like, okay, it's not supposed to be a halt instruction here. We're supposed to pop the return address. So the first thing you need to remember is how do we pop using C statement? So can somebody remind me how to use C statement to do the pop? If not for anything else, I hope you guys remember that the sequences of pushing is exactly the opposite of the sequences to pop in every way imaginable. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means we are going to do the reverse of this operation first. So we're gonna to have to save the retrieved value from what the stack pointer is pointing to, and then we proceed to, instead of decrement the stack pointer, we'll proceed to increment the stack pointer. So that's also what we talked about last Thursday, okay? So I mentioned these things you know, because I want you guys to make a, uh, to establish the continuity between what we talk about today and what we have already talked about in the past, okay? Because you know, establishing that continuity is important. You know, that's how we can develop a deeper understanding of concepts, is to keep that connection all the way you know, as, as far back as possible, okay? So now we go like, okay, um, how do we do something like this? There's, there's only one instruction in the opto table that can do something like this, okay? Where the, the reference is on the right-hand side of the equal, so this is also me demonstrating how to use the opto table. So when, when you look at the RTL or column C of the opto table, only one of them has an assignment where the right-hand side of the assignment is the one part that is dereferencing. So I believe that is, uh, where is it? Right here, there we go. So you can see that you know, in this case, why the register is the reference, it provides the value so that you can update a register with that. That's the only time where we have you know, the referencing on the right-hand side using a register, so other than the PC. So now we go back to the code and go like, okay, I have a pretty good idea what, of what to do. We need an LD, but LD requires you know, two operands. So you can use you know, whatever register you want to use here. It can be register C if you want, okay? And this one, you don't have a choice because we have already agreed that the stack pointer is register D. Is that okay, right? 
And then the next instruction needs to increment the stack pointer. So now we have to go like, oh, okay, since we have a decrement to decrement, now we have an increment to, guess what, increment. So that part is pretty easy. Okay, so let me move things around a little bit and put it here. So the next question is, um, now we have register C containing where we need to go, but how do we get there? Okay, so that's kind of the next question. But before we do that, we'll put a halt instruction again. So this time we'll test this program again and make sure that register C has the location that we need to go in order to continue at the call. Okay, so that's the purpose of this particular version of the program. So I'm gonna exit, make sure we save the file and then run the whole thing again. I just have to hit up arrow key twice. Press the enter key and it will automatically do the rest. And since everything is just a shell script, if you guys want to figure out how this magic happens in the back end, you're more than welcome to. And I know some people will do that. All right, so we now go to go back to here, and this is the new trace. It's automatically updated, okay? So last time we stopped right here, okay, on line 13, which is location five, that, that was where the halt instruction was. Okay, but now we go like, okay, let's retrieve whatever is on the top of the stack. Okay, so we'll move indirect to the stack pointer to register C. So register C is now updated with zero E instead of zero C because the code got longer. Okay, so that's why the return address is changed a little bit. And then we go like, okay, let's increment the stack pointer. The stack pointer went from FF back to zero zero, which is a good thing. Okay, because now the stack pointer is quote unquote balanced. It was back to where it was before. And then we hit the halt instruction. Once again, this is the halt instruction in function F. The real question is, does register C contain the location of where I need to go to continue execution in the caller, which is main in this case. So we go to the assemble tab and then we look up location zero E and ask, is that the location that we need to go back to, you know, corresponding to the label uh, return address from first call of F? Yep. Okay. So now we just need that one last mechanism of, okay, this register already has the location of where we need to go to continue execution. How do we get there? So which register do you need to change in order, in order to change the direction of execution. We have registers A, B, C, D, the program counter, the instruction register, and okay, fine, here we'll throw in the microcode pointer as well, because those are all the registers, and the flex register, those are all the registers that we have in the processor. Which one dictates where we are going to fetch the next opcode? All right, so I think some of you know the answer, you just you do not want to say it. It's the program counter, okay? The program counter holds the address of where we are going to fetch the next opcode, which also means if you alter the program counter, you're changing the flow of the program. That's what JMPI did, except the problem with JMPI is every time you execute the same JMPI instruction, it will always end up at the same place. But when you're returning from a subroutine, from a function, where it needs to return to kind of depends on where you called it from, okay? So that's why JMPI cannot get a job done, but it is a good idea to begin with. So now we go to the opto table, and then we just check out all the things that can change the program counter and then you guys can tell me which one can get this done. It's already on this page. Give me the row number of the opcode that can go like, hey, if you have the location that you want to go to in the register already, this will update the program counter according to that. So we can just go like, okay, let's go over there to continue execution. So, hmm? Row 25, that is correct. Because row 25 has a RTL of PC equals to X, X being one of the four registers. 
So if you already have the return address in, let's say, register C in this case, all we need to do is like, oh, let's copy register C to the program counter. Then the next fetch is going to go to whatever the new program counter is. Is that okay? Making sense? So this is the last instruction that we're introducing in this class. Okay, you know, I'm saving this one because you know, it, it makes no sense to talk about this one in the earlier. Okay, so now that we know this trick, we can go back to the editor here. Okay, go back to this notepad. And now say, okay, we know how to do this now. It's a JMP register C in this case. Okay. There's a certain lag time here. So JMP C without the I, okay? With the I, you're specifying a constant, okay? We are always going to continue at the same place. Every time we get to the JMP I instruction, it will always continue at the same place. JMP without the I and then the register is dynamic. It depends on the value of the register at the time that you execute JMP C in this case. Is that okay? So that means, you know, I can put anything in register C in order to continue execution at that spot. All right? So now we will, you know, save this code and run it again. So save and then use Ripple Spider to do this. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> it still takes a long time, you know, because we're still using Google Sheets to do um, the assembling. Okay, but, you know, the trace is automatic. So now we go back to the trace again and see whether this time it went to the correct halt instruction. So uh, this is the wrong tab because we have to look at the analysis tab. There we go. Well, what do you think? So what is changed from the last run? Well, the last run had a fault instruction here. And this time we have JMP C. And we can see that register C has a value of 0B. And we did continue execution at location 0E. When we execute the JMP C instruction, and that is the only halt instruction left, which is in main. So are we doing okay so far? Because you know, I have completed the whole sequence of calling a function and returning from the function. Are we good so far? All right, so now we're gonna go back to the original C code in the module, okay? Because you know, in the original C code, there were two calls to F. This is the first call or invocation. This is the second one. So now we are saying, okay, can we do this again? I bet you the second time it won't go back to the correct location. So we'll go ahead and change the program so that we can see if we can do that. So that means you know, in main, I'm gonna have to call and return again. So once again, okay, if I were to document how to call, the first thing is to push the return address. And then the second thing is a JMPI to the name of the function like that. The question is, what is the return address? Can I reuse the label called return address from first call to F? I think the name of the label already gives you the answer. You cannot, exactly, because the second call has a different return address, okay? Because with the second call, I need to return here. Okay, I need to return here. Okay, fine. I need to return here and not to return to right after this label. So that means every call requires its own label to mark where you need the call to return to. So now we have return address from second call to F. We'll put it here. We need to push it on the stack. So now we just go like, okay, fine. You know, we know the sequence of how to push something. We need to decrement D and then LDI. Now you don't have to use register A, you can use register B for instance. But the, the important part is which label are we loading into register B? It is return address from second call to F this time. Because this is marking the sec this is the second call, not the first call. So we do this. And then we do a SPDB in this case, and that should be the program. 
Okay. Question? Functions are still called. Huh? Oh, okay. Okay. Let's keep it this way and see whether the script can detect the problem. Okay. So every error is an opportunity to learn something. It, com it comes back and say, validating of the code, it did not assemble correctly. So it did correctly identify that uh, we have a problem. So if you have a problem, you know, if it does not, it does not assemble correctly, you really don't have a choice but go to the source tab because that's where the error is going to be reported. So in this case, it says, you know, return address from second call of F is undefined because the label definition itself had the typo. Okay, so now we go back and you know, let's go ahead and fix the problem. Okay, so we go back here. And it even gives you a red line here to indicate that the, the command that we just executed had a problem. Okay, so do you guys know how SigLin or the shell is capable of going like, uh oh, something went wrong? There's an exit code to every script or executable. If the exit code is zero, it means everything is good. If the exit code is anything other than zero, that means something has gone wrong. So in my script, I return an exit code of one when the assembler comes back and bark at me and go like, uh-uh, this is not working. So that's why, you know, looking at the color of the prompt will give you an idea of, oh, okay, something needs to be fixed. It didn't quite work correctly. I did not even notice this because I have not, I usually do not use SigLin because I have Linux and this is all kind of native using in Bash. But, you know, in this case, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. All right. So we just have to go to fix the label name. Okay. So second call. Oops. It's case insensitive. Yeah. But, yeah, I want to make it the same. Second call to F, okay, the C is not supposed to be here. We got transposed. Notepad is dyslexic today. There we go, so we'll try again. Okay, object code is good, excellent. All right, so everything works out this time. So we go back to the analysis tab and then we just watch the code execute. It's a, it's a little bit longer this time. So the way we look at this is you can, you can look at it from multiple perspective. You can just look at it from the line number perspective. So this is the end of the first call and this is the beginning of the second call. Now, how do we know this is the beginning of the second call? Eh, quite a few ways. This is line 27. So if you go back to the source tab, line 27 is right here, which is the uh, the push of the return address of the second call. Is that okay? So I'm gonna pause here, okay? Yeah, because you know, even though we only introduced one additional instruction, which is the JMT and then a register instruction, the, the way I combine the instructions to get this to work is what makes you know, this particular class, it can make it a little bit complicated. So let me see if there are any questions from you guys, just you know, looking at the trays. Okay, you know, let's go back to the trays here. Are there any questions? Yep, go ahead. Why are there so many platforms or why not just use FL? Just why are we incrementing definition? Because you can have recursion. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at recursion. Okay, how many people like recursion in this class? I will have two hands up. I love recursion. Okay, because recursion is a different way of looking at things. In some way, recursion is actually easier to understand compared to loops. Okay, so let's check check out recursion first. Okay, 
then you guys go like, but we haven't even talked about parameters or anything like that. You know, how do do we how do we do recursion? Trust me, we can. So we'll go ahead and do recursion, and the first thing we do is to write the C code so that we can translate that into assembly code. Okay, so I'll just say recursion, recursion, recursion. Dot C. Alrighty. So all I need is a global variable. So this is not going to compile. Okay, you know. Well, if you guys want to watch this compile, I can do that too. Let Let's make this compile using uh, online GDB. Create new project, and it's plain C. I just like plain C. You know, nothing fancy here. And I'm going to use a global variable, so pound include stp int.h, so I have control over the width of my types. I'm going to use a global variable, you know, simply because we haven't talked about local variables and how to pass by reference, that sort of thing. So this is my counter. And counter is initialized to 5 to begin with. And here's function f. Function f still does not do a single thing. Oops. There we go. Except it checks whether counter is uh, non zero or not. Okay? So it will say if counter is greater than zero, then we do one complicated thing, which is simply to decrement it. Otherwise, do nothing and just return. Is that okay? Uh, wait, there's one more thing. We're going to call f again here. Start the recursion. There we go. So you look at this function and go like, Okay, what is it going to do? Well, the first time we call f, it will check the counter. Counter will have a value of 5. 5 is greater than 0. That's true. It's going to decrement counter. Counter becomes 4. It's going to call itself. Is that okay? And we keep doing this until counter reaches 0. If count, when counter reaches 0, then it goes like, wait, I don't, I don't need to execute the then statement anymore. So there's no else statement. The else statement can be looked at as non-existent, or it is just empty. Okay, there's nothing to do for the else. So if it has nothing to do, what are we going to do? Return. What does it return to? The code right after this one. And what is, what is that going to do? Return again. And then returns to the previous invocation. What is it going to do? Return. So it's going to return, 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 return. And then the last one is going to return back to the caller, the first call to F, okay? So we are gonna put the first call to F in main, okay? So I'm gonna take out the hello world, and we'll just make the first call over here. Is that okay so far? So this, this is an utterly useless program, okay? Because it doesn't really do anything, but it illustrates recursion, okay? And we can translate it into assembly. We have enough time to do it, actually, okay? Surprisingly, this can be, done you know, with all the with the amount of time that we have left. Okay, so the first thing is to check out the, uh, the C code and look at the behavior. If you are to run this code, it won't give you anything, right? Because there's no print F, there's nothing, there's no output whatsoever. So the only way that makes sense you know, to make use of this program is to put a breakpoint eh, right about here. So every time it has to evaluate this, we're gonna just pause the execution. So now we go to debug, okay? And then we just run the code, okay? You can use start if you want because we already have a breakpoint here. So we go like, okay, this is the first time we get to F, it paused. And then we look at the global variable. Does it have it here? Nope, it only has the local variables. You can put a, uh, in the watch expression here, you can actually um, you know, evaluate counter. And it doesn't show the value of counter here. Hmm. Well, I can always just do a print counter in GDB. It is five. So now we con we continue execution, and it stops again. And then you say, what is counter? It is now four. No big surprises. But there's one cool thing you can do in GDB. It is called, uh, what is the name? Backtrace, BT. There we go. So this is backtrace. So what backtrace is doing is to say, where are we right now? We are in um, function F 
line 16 of main dot two. Okay, now no big surprises here. So how did we get here? I was called by function f on line 19. So this was the recursive call that caused the next invocation. We have two invocations of f right now. Is that okay? The first invocation, how did we get that? From main. So on to, from the main function on line 45, that's how we got to f the first time. The second time is the recursive call. So I can now say, let's continue. Print the counter. Okay, it's now three, not surprising. Continue. Print, oops, counter. It is now two, it is now one, and it is now zero. So we look at backtrace again. And now we go like, oh, ah, look at this. So we have how many invocations of F right now on the stack? There are six of them, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that okay? And if I single step right now, it's gonna go all the way back to main. Because if I single step, which is just S, it goes all the way back to line 21, which is the end of this function call. It's going to be line 26 back to main right now. Because <laughs> it, it, cannot, it cannot pause the execution when it is on a, um, I guess, a sequence of returns. So it's just going to go return, 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 all the way back to main. Because there's no place for it to stop in between. So if I were to do a backtrace right now, we're back in main. All those invocations were done. All right. So I'm not sure how many of you are grasping, you know, the execution of this program or how to what to make out of the backtrace display here. But if I need to do this, you know, in you know, assembly language, this is how I can do it. So I'm just I'm just going to change my original program to reflect this. So I would do a note pad of um, call return. Call return. Now remember the context of you know, this particular program is to answer the question of you know, why do we need a stack pointer, right? So what we do need now is I'm gonna have to dedicate C as my counter. Okay, so I'm gonna just comment here, use register C as quote unquote counter because counter starts with C. So in main, you know, somebody has to initialize, you know, um, register C. So I'll just put it here. So um, LDI C with five, and then I cannot use register C anymore because register C now has a particular purpose in live. So we'll have to use you know, one of the other two registers. But you know, right here we also have to implement the conditional statement. So now we have to say, has counter reached zero? Can somebody tell me a trick that can do this without compare? I just need to know whether register C is zero or not. And C C is zero. Yep, that's right. Very good. And C C J Z I to um, a label. I'll just call this label F and if, okay, because that's the end of the conditional statement. And this is where you know it needs to go. F underscore and if needs to go here. So now the question is, what if um, I end up here? That means the register C is not zero. And then I got a few things to do. I need to decrement C, okay? You know, because you know, they have counter minus minus. And then I need to call F again. I go like, but we are already in the F. How can we call F again? Well, just call F again. The very same way as the way we call F in main. There's no difference whatsoever, okay? So how do we call F again? We have to push the return address, so we have to now first we'll label the return address. So we'll say return from recursive call to F, okay? We'll put it here. We have to push that on the stack. So that means we have to decrement the stack corner. LDI, I cannot use C anymore, but any register A or B would be fine. Return from recur call to F. SPPA, this is this completes the pushing of the return address, and then we JMPI to F. 
just like that. In other words, when you look at the sequence of how we call a function, this sequence is exactly the same as the, func as the sequence that we have seen before, which is this particular sequence. It is also this particular sequence. Okay. But right now, I'm going to delete the second call because you'll, to resemble the C code, we don't have a second call. Just like that. Okay. So the question is, did I make a mistake? Okay, because I hoped a lot of times that I would actually make a mistake. Why do you think that is the case? Okay, I'm gonna run the code, but you guys are ponder will, will ponder why I wish I could make a mistake, like a really honest mistake. Yes. Exactly, okay? If I make an honest mistake, which means it's not strict, okay? It's not like, you know, before the lecture, I go like, yeah, I can kind of make a mistake over here, and then I can tell you guys how to fix it, and so on and so forth. I can, if I make an honest mistake, it means I did not even know about it. Then I can show you guys how to debug a program. What my thought processes are, okay? What do I think of? What tools do I use? What reason do I use in order to find out what went wrong, okay? Because if it is a script kind of thing, I mean, it doesn't work, okay? Because you know, I already knew where the bug was. I don't need reasoning to find it. Okay, so let's hope that this program did not work. I mean, how many times do you get a professor to say, I wish things don't work in my class, so I can actually illustrate something that is of use to you guys. All right, so let's check it out, okay? Bing, 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 bing. Ah, okay, it worked. Darn it. Okay, how did it work? How do I know that it worked? Well, there are a few indicators. The first one is I got to the only halt instruction in the program. If this program did not work, I most likely will land somewhere. Okay, you know, and the program will just go all over the place. Second thing, the stack, com the stack pointer went back to zero. In other words, the stack is once again balanced, okay? Whatever I push on the stack, I ended up popping every single one, okay? I did not leave anything behind on the stack. So that's also important. The third indicator is register C should be a zero. So the last update to register C indeed turned it into zero. Well, that's not the update. The update is um, decrement C, which is here. That's the last update. What about the stack, okay? Because the whole point is to illustrate how the stack is used to store all the return addresses, right? So now the question is, how many locations on the stack did I end up using? Well, the only thing you need to do is to track down column C, okay? Look at column C. This is the first call, okay? The first call pushed the return address to main. This is the second call, which is already recursive. This is F calling F the first time. This is F calling F the second time, third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, which is the last time, okay? Then you go like, but how do I, can, how can I see the unwinding of the stack, okay? How did the stack, you know, how did the code make use of the stack to return gradually? Well, you look at how we grab the content, okay? So the, how we grab the content is reflected in column B, so column B does not use a single equal, it uses double equal. Because it is not telling you that the location is changed. It's telling you we just accessed a location in RAM and it has a content of, in this case, FF. So FF is used by the JMPD instruction to get back to one one. That's the first return, okay? But what do we do after the first return? Okay, the stack pointer got changed. The stack pointer went back to FB at the end of the return sequence. <coughs> so that by the time we get to the return location or the return address, uh, which is this location here, we are just returning again, okay? So this is the return address. But what we do at the return address is to return again. So it grabbed the content on the stack again. It is also one one in hexadecimal and then we proceed to increment the stack pointer to deallocate that location. Because once you pop something on the stack, 
that value is no longer useful on the stack. So we have to quote unquote deallocated. Deallocating something from the stack is simply to increment the stack pointer, which is equivalent to SP plus plus in the C plus plus code. So that means you know, if you just track down the number of times that we go to location 11, that is the number of times it returned to itself in the recursive call. But the last time it returned is going back to main because the first call was from main. All right, so this particular program illustrates you know, what you mentioned earlier, which is why do we use the stack? Because if there's only one location that we use to store the return address, we can just kind of make it static. Okay, you can use the LDI instruction to grab you know, the return address. But because you know, we, can, we have to handle recursion, so that means that location cannot be static. It has to be using the stack you know, last in, first out order, which means the last function that you call is the first one that, we, that you return from. So are we starting to make some connections you know, between the concept of a stack, which is basically just last in, first out, and the concept of calling and returning? We get it so far? All right. So I can upload this code you know, because it is not actually visible to you guys. I can just put it into the usual assembler that you have access to. So let me just kind of grab this, okay, copy. Let me go to the usual assembler, which I think is this one. Go to the source tab go here and just paste it. There we go. <clears throat> okay, yep, it is the right one because I can see the giraffe already here. All right, so do we have any questions at this point? So this demonstration is, I think, very important, okay? You know, because if you, look, if you look at the trace, you know, there's no trace over here because I did not use my usual, um, what do you call that? Uh, I did not use my usual, um, Find it. Um, reverse spider. Okay. So now I will do one more thing. Okay. If I don't have reverse spider, how do I get the same thing working? So this is the last thing. So I would illustrate that. Okay. In order to do that, you need to do the following. So you will need to, uh, I just go to one particular folder here. So we'll have to um, start up Logisim first. Okay. So start up Logisim. Go to processor 0004, like that, okay? And then we switch back to the assembler. Go to the RAM file. Go to file, go to download, download CSV. Store that as call return.csv. Go back here, and I, okay, I, I lied. This is not the way to do it. The way to do it is to run Logisim on the command line which is Java, that's jar. And then I have to locate the um, processor 0004 file, which in my case is in document CISP310 processor, processor zero, uh oh, it's not there. Ah. Okay, why did I stash it? <clears throat> Let's try that. Uh, processor, processor. Where did I put my processor file? Well, I know it's in my um, reverse spider folder. Let me see. That chance. Yes, and reverse spider processor. Oh, I know why. Because the auto complete doesn't work because it's looking for a jar file. Okay, that was my bad. Um, okay, there we go. So we started Logisim, but there's the command gets much longer than this. So now we have to load the processor file. Okay, there we go. So now we specify the actual processor file. And if you do it like this, it will run the processor file in the GUI mode, which is not what we want. So now we say dash TTY table and then dash load the file that we just downloaded, which is call return.csv. And then we capture the output of this to call 
return dot csv. Um, wait, it's already okay. I know it, it wants to see the dash load first. And this needs to be circ. There we go. Dash tty table. There we go. All right, so that captures everything in the tsv file. And then we switch back to the assembler, go to uh, raw trace, trace raw data, go to file, go to uh, import, and then you have to specify upload and use the TSV file in this case. And where is my TS? Oh. Oh, maybe it did hibernate. It did hibernate. Cool. Ha ha ha. Right. Well, Linux power. <laughs> All right. So I need to get you guys the. Um, okay. So let me get you the um, the homework assignment. I mean, the lab first. So the lab today is already visible to you. You know, you just need the access code. It is stack operations. And the access code is LIFO, not surprisingly. L-I-S-O, all lowercase, L-I. <clears throat> there you go. And, well, guess what? OBS is still recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is supposed to have created, you know, TSV the TSV file. Yep, it is created. So I'm not really sure why it couldn't find it the first time. All right, so let me try this again. You know, this is con a continuation. Um we'll just look for call return dot TSV. Okay. Maybe I just overlooked it. Okay. Because I want to show you how cumbersome it is to do it the other way. You have to replace the current sheet. Um, it is tab separated and also turn off convert text to numbers, um, dates, and formulae. Import data. And then after that, you can go to analysis. But it doesn't look the same. It just has a lot of empty rows, you know, because you know, that's basically what the trace file, you know, has is a lot of emptiness. Okay. But it this it, it's giving you the same output. So if you go all the way to the bottom. It will give you exactly the same trace. It's just that you know the presentation is mm, not as good as the other one. All right. So I, I think I hope I hope this convinced you to use the the tool instead of doing this manually. Even though it can be done manually, okay, it is just a lot of steps. All right. I'm stopping the recorder. And uh, can you guys get into the lab? Okay. Thanks.